Superstar Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Black Power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
All right, folks, today is Friday, January 20, 2023. Coming up, a Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. The Biden administration, uh, they are reinstating a fair housing requirement that uh, is going to pl play a central role in forcing cities to have plans to end segregation. We'll talk about that on today's show. Also on today's show, uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis continues his attack uh, on African Americans. But the question that we're going to be dealing with is, again, what is next? Is this going to be the Republican strategy when it comes to these culture wars? Uh, that's the issue that we uh, are going to be also studying also uh, on today's show. Uh, I want to talk about uh, African-Americans and the issue of building capacity as it relates to our businesses. Uh, I'm going to unpack that thing because I really believe that in many ways we are operating far too small and a small mentality is contributing to our businesses not being able to grow. Marilyn Mosby loses her high power defense team will tell you why a federal judge is trying to hold her lead lawyer in criminal contempt. And you often seen him on our show. Uh, also on today's show, Donald Trump withdraws his lawsuit against a New York Attorney General Tish, Dan Tish James. Could it be because a judge slapped him with a million dollars in fines for filing frivolous lawsuits? Plus, we'll hear from Dr. Rowe uh, talking about part two of our conversation on healthy eating. Folks, all of that on Roller Mark Unfiltered, the Black Star Network. It's time to bring the funk. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Roland Martin here. Uh, normally I'll be in the studio, but uh, when you get a flat tire, hey, it happens. So you got to go live from the car. So uh, that's where I am uh, here in uh, the nation's uh, capital, folks. Uh, a, a lot of things happening uh, out here in terms of uh, to um, uh, today's news. And, and one of the things that uh, I want to focus on, uh, we talked about this on yesterday. Uh, and that is what is happening in Florida uh, with Governor Ron DeSantis. Uh, what By him uh, targeting this African-American studies class, what Ron DeSantis is really saying and doing uh, is targeting African-Americans. Now, this is not the first time he's done that, but I need people to understand, and people to understand what is going on here. This, folks, is not new. Let me say this again. It's not new. And you're going to see more of this. I laid this out of my book, White Fear, in terms of what the strategy is. It is by design for a Ron DeSantis to get white voters angry and upset and feeling as if they are being attacked. Listen to what I'm saying. This is, by, this is the strategy...
All right, folks, just had the technical difficulty here. So, uh, again, literally, uh, I'm broadcast from the side of the road uh, because of a uh, flat tire. And so um, we're going to be talking about Ron DeSantis, what he's doing in Florida, but also the case of Marilyn Mosby out of, New out of uh, Maryland. Uh, she's having to replace her entire defense team because the federal judge is trying to hold her lead lawyer, Scott uh, Bolden, in criminal contempt. Uh, and so, uh, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, and so we're gonna actually going to go to a break. We're going to sort out our technical issues. Uh, and again, folks, uh, my signal might freeze. If so, Michael Imhotep, uh, he'll take over to, to question our guest. Uh, so just understand that's what we're working through. Uh, this was not expected, uh, but you got to do what you got to do. Uh, and so we'll do that. So this is what we'll do. Uh, we're going to go to a break. We'll come back. We're going to discuss the Marilyn Mosby case. We're going to talk about Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and this whole issue of white fear and how that is going to be part of the Republican playbook over the next two years. Bank on it ha happening over and over. OK, uh, and so and we'll also talk about Moms for Liberty taking over school boards. Now, too many of us have been falling asleep and how, how they are trying to gonna do more of that uh, in the future. Folks, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also support us with our Bring the Funk fan club. So you're checking money orders to PO Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, battle sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Okay. What happened to time cues? You got to keep. People think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I got to tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. So people don't really want to have this conversation. No, they don't. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Our legal roundtable is back in session as we look at yet another potential landmark case being considered by the United States Supreme Court. This one is called 303 Creative versus Alenis and may be the most important and far reaching First Amendment, that is freedom of speech, case of our time. It could, depending on how the court rules, open the door for a return of Jim Crow segregation laws. It's true. If you say we can discriminate against one, you're saying we can discriminate against all. That's on the next Black Tape. Don't miss it. Right here on the Black Star Network. So this is Roger Bob. I got a message for Roland Mascot. Oh, I'm sorry, Ascot Martin. Buddy, you're supposed to be hooking me up with some of these mascots. I'm sorry, ascots that you claim to wear. Where's mine, buddy? Hey, yo, Peace World, what's going on? It's the Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. All right, folks, former Baltimore State's Attorney um, Marilyn Mosby now has to find her a new legal defense team uh, because a federal judge uh, is going after her lead attorney or former lead attorney, Scott Bolden, trying to hold him, him in criminal contempt. Uh, of course, uh, she's preparing to face perjury and mortgage fraud charges uh, when the motion was filed on behalf of her six private lawyers to withdraw for a variety of reasons. U.S. District Judge Lydia K. Grigsby was an African-American and overseeing the case. She issued a gag order and threatened to hold Mosley's lead attorney, Scott Bolden, uh, in criminal contempt of court. The judge said Bolden violated several court rules, including profanity on the courthouse steps, disclosing confidential juror responses, and filing a motion without a Maryland license. If found in contempt, he faces penalties of possibly being removed from the case for prohibited from practicing in Maryland, referred to the U.S. Attorney's Office for prosecution or possible jail, is until January 31st to argue his case. The six attorneys asked to step away, four because they worked for Bolden's law firm, citing conflict of interest. The remaining two said they didn't have the time and resources 
to take over the defense alone. Joining me now is Kalia Coleman, a partner at Riley Safer Homes in uh, Cancilla. She's also a former federal prosecutor. Okay, so I, 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 I'm sorry, just Kalia, just help, help me out here. So the, the judge is angry that Scott, in a in a press conference, said the word bullshit on the courthouse steps. Is this federal judge overreaching? Well, Roland, uh, certainly it, some could view it that way and others may not. Um, I think what she, uh, what the judge uh, was most uh, concerned about is that the purpose of her gag order was sort of to restrict uh, how and the manner in which both sides uh, discuss the case. And perhaps that's uh, what... Uh, sparked her to get angry by Mr. Bolden's comments. But certainly it raised this question, right? Because, you know, we live in America where uh, typically, you know, there's the First Amendment and certainly you expect a defense attorney to be passionate and advocate for his or her client. But I think the court uh, saw it as a means of, of disrespect because, you know, as part of instituting the gag order, I'm sure there was some type of discussion about the parameters of what should and shouldn't be discussed. Uh, to the media in light of uh, the high press and the, the high uh, level of attention that this case has received, given Ms. Mosby's uh, prior status as the Baltimore state's attorney. Um, the other thing that, so it's, she's looking at criminal contempt. That's, that, that's a heavy uh, charge there. I, I, I break this down for us. How is it criminal contempt? So, Roland, you are absolutely right. It is very rare that uh, an attorney is subject to criminal contempt charges. Um, a lot of attention has been placed on the violation of the gag order, but perhaps um, it's the, the combination of things. Uh, you know, just based on my review of things, one of the issues the judge uh, took real issue with is the fact uh, that uh, there were certain documents filed, um, and Mr. Bolden is not licensed to practice in uh, the District of Maryland federal court. It's my understanding he's a D.C. attorney. And so as attorneys, we have to be licensed to practice in, you know, the jurisdiction or the court that we are seeking to file. And there's a way around that. Usually you seek admission uh, pro hoc vice is the legal term, uh, where you may not be admitted, but you're asking the court to grant you permission to, you know, appear in court and file documents. Otherwise, you just, you, you have on your team attorneys from that jurisdiction who is licensed, and then they assist you. And here, it appears that Mr. Bolden um, filed documents. He signed those documents, and he's not licensed to practice. So I believe that might be uh, the driving force behind the criminal contempt charges. Although uh, I will admit that seems to be a pretty harsh uh, sort of strategy that the, the judge is taking or approach. Um, but uh, certainly uh, she seems to be really uh, disappointed and is trying to convey that she is not happy with uh, how Mr. Bolden has proceeded in the matter. You know, one of the things that, again, when, when a lot of people don't realize, and I say this all the time, federal judges have tremendous discretion. When I heard, when we were talking about the appointments by President Joe Biden, a lot of people saying, oh, you know, these judges, it's no big deal. I'm, I, I kept saying, y'all don't understand the power that federal judges actually have and how, with that, how they can wield that power. That's absolutely right, uh, Roland. Um, you know, they have lifetime appointment. Um, they are extremely powerful. The federal system is one that, uh, you know, obviously has existed for a really long time. And federal judges are generally very well respected. Um, and so you are absolutely right. As a former federal prosecutor, you know, I practice in front of federal judges for a period of five years. And during that time, like what you learn is that they do have power, but they also are, you know, uh, they're strictly by the book. And it's important to so make sure that you're playing by the rules, because uh, if you do not, uh, there are some grave consequences that could result from that, as we're seeing here. The, uh, now, uh now, as a result, 
um, the federal public defender's office uh, will have to take over her case. Ex explain that because look, a lot of people watch these these crime shows and others. You often say here, public defenders are overworked. People don't actually get a vigorous defense as a result. Those are some of the things that you hear. Uh, but explain uh, how it works on the federal level. So a couple things steps back, Roland. Like, first, the motion to withdraw, it's my understanding, is still pending. It was recently filed. And so I think what's important to be understood is that, you know, they will have to appear before the judge, and the judge will actually have to grant that motion to withdraw. You cannot withdraw from a case without official approval of the court. Um, so as part of that uh, process, the judge uh, will likely have a hearing in which she has the defense attorneys to explain in greater detail uh, their basis for saying there's a conflict of interest and they are unable to continue representation of Ms. Mosby. They'll, you know, she will also hear from the prosecutors, which as a former prosecutor and considering, you know, the where the case is, it is set for trial in, I believe, at the end of March. I'm sure the prosecution will likely object um, because there's this concept of continuity. And when you have counsel, new counsel coming in in such a, you know, high-profile case, they likely will ask for an extension of time to prepare for the trial. Now, with that being said, assuming that the judge does grant the motion to withdraw and the public defenders, a second issue that has to be addressed is whether or not Ms. Mosby will actually qualify for the services of the public defender. You know, everyone under the Sixth Amendment has a right to, uh, you know, counsel, but the public defender's office has a unique role. They represent what's called the legal term indigent defendants, uh, individuals who cannot afford to pay for private attorneys. Um, but certainly here, I imagine that Ms. Mosby has probably acquired a large amount of, you know, legal bills, so she possibly will qualify for the services of the public defender. So to get to your point, you know, the federal defender's office and public defenders, even on the state level, I think is a misconception about the quality of those lawyers. They deal with a high volume of cases, right? So they don't necessarily have a, a smaller caseload as some or most private defense attorneys, but they are trained, skilled lawyers who went to law school just like private attorneys. Um, and certainly, uh, when you talk about the federal uh, defender program, I imagine that they would likely staff uh, some of their um, higher level or more experienced attorneys to deal uh, with this case, given uh, Ms. Mosby's status. All right, then. We surely appreciate you breaking this down for us. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. All right, then. Michael Imhotep hosts the African History uh, uh, Show. So, Michael, what does he make of this? I mean, th th this this sounds like this is a judge who who really, really is pissed off with his defense team. A criminal contempt? Yeah, you know, Roland, uh, I, I've been following this story some, and I, I, I read the article from the Associated Press on this, and it's a couple of things here. Number one, uh, what you were saying about federal judges being important, that's, you, you're so right about this, and unfortunately, so many of our people don't understand the judicial branch of the federal government and how important it is that uh, President Joe Biden has has made uh, a record number uh, of nominations to the federal bench and gotten so many of them confirmed, number one. Um, number two, um, I, I, can't, I can't rule out in my mind that somehow this is retaliation against um, uh, former state's attorney Marilyn Mosby uh, when it came to prosecuting police officers, like when it came to Freddie Gray and the officers that were believed to be involved in the death of Freddie Gray. Because it, when, when you look at the charges, um, Mosby, in 2020, Mosby submitted requests for one-time withdrawals of $40,000 and $50,000, respectfully, uh, respectively, from uh, Baltimore's deferred compensation plans, according to her indictment. Prosecutors alleged that Mosby falsely certified that she experienced financial hardship because of, uh, because of the coronavirus, but she actually Got received it. nearly $250,000 salary in 2020. Yeah, but one, uh, taxes are going to take at least a third of that. Two, you don't know what other financial obligations she had, and right, she right. talked about how it impacted her consulting business, et cetera. So... Right. Well, that, but, that's, but, that's, but, that's, but, but that's why she's on trial. That's no, I understand. And so, and so the, the, we, the issue for her right now is what this judge could be taking away her defense team. And so hold tight one yes. second. 
Uh, okay. I, hold on one second. I got, I got, I got to go to. Uh, we get come back. Uh, come back. We're going to talk about uh, the Ron DeSantis case as well. Uh, you're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, people can't live with them, can't live without them. Our relationships often have more ups and downs than a boardwalk roller coaster, but it doesn't have to be that way. Trust your gut. Whenever your gut is like, this isn't healthy, this isn't right, I don't like the way that I'm being treated, this goes for males and females. Trust your gut, and then whenever that gut feeling comes, have a conversation. Knowing how to grow or when to go, a step-by-step -step guide on the next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. Hi, I'm B.B. Winans. Hi, I'm Kim Burrell. Hi, I'm Carl Payne. Hey, everybody, this is Sherry Shepard. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered, and while he's doing Unfiltered, I'm practicing the wobble. on the Black Star Network, the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, they've been meeting in the nation's capital last, actually this week, uh, and today President Biden addressed, addressed them at the White House. Uh, this is, the remember, you have the African American Mayors Association, the U.S. Conference of Mayors. A number of the nation's black mayors uh, were in town. Mayors from, of course, uh, from Charlotte, from Atlanta, uh, Little Rock, a number of places all across the country. And uh, this is an opportunity for these mayors to not only meet with federal officials, the Biden administration, uh, when it comes to funding and issues along those lines. One of the issues that was major was climate change uh, that was talked about uh, as well. Uh, and so uh, at the White House today, uh, President Biden spoke to them, laid out uh, his vision for the country as well as, an, as they celebrated uh, today, the second anniversary of the Biden administration uh, being in the White House. Uh, and folks, uh, do we have Biden's speech ready? Okay, here is uh, what Biden had to say to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You better sit down. You don't want this going to my head. <laughs> A kid from Scranton. Look, uh, <clears throat> Mayor Suarez, uh, thank you for your leadership at the conference. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a little frog in my throat. But, uh, and Andy, thank you for that introduction. You know, uh, it's wonderful to finally welcome all of you to the White House after not being able to be here because of the pandemic for so long. We appreciate it a great deal. And uh, some of you know I started my career as a county councilman 
<clears throat> in the state of Delaware, and, uh, and, uh, and then I ran for the U.S. Senate because serving as a local official was too hard. Uh, <laughs> they know where you live. <laughs> they knock on your door. And uh, uh, I've always had enormous respect for the job you do. And by the way, Suarez, you and I have something else in common. You know what it is? We both married way above our station. <laughs> way, way above our station. <laughs> you all think I'm kidding. Some things are just self-evident. <laughs> today, today is two years since I was sworn in as president. And, uh, <laughs> Now, with your help, <clears throat> with your help, we've gotten a lot done. <clears throat> I think if you look around the room, we got a lot of cabinet members who are mayors. A lot of mayors. You got old Mitch Landry from Nolens down there, you know, and uh, he—that's like being mayor of a country. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I tell you what, my daughter went down to Tulane <clears throat> University in large part because of his dad, his long story, but uh, when he was mayor, and uh, I thought she's going to come home talking with a boy talking funny at me, you know what I mean, from, <laughs> from, from Bio Lafouche or something. Uh, but, uh, and uh, Mayor Pete is, uh, <clears throat> even though he's the secretary, I still call him Mayor Pete. And, you know, you got uh, Marty Walsh from Boston. I don't know where Marty is. We got a lot of mayors, a lot of mayors. And that's why I think we're making such progress. Look, um, the fact is that, um, you know, uh, I was uh, it's fitting that we are here together today and because you mayors know how to get things done. And that's not hyperbole. It's a fact. Because you have no choice, as a matter of fact. Yesterday, I was in California. We're grappling with historic California. <laughs> Start off, the governor looked at me and said, uh, Mr. President, we used to be the fifth largest economy in the world. Now we're the fourth. Uh, if that's true in the world. But I tell you what. So I genuflected, and we moved on. <laughs> I said, that means you don't need that $10 billion we just gave you, right? <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> You all think I'm kidding. That's what we did, $10 billion. <laughs> But all kidding aside, he's a great governor and has written well. But look, dealing with historic storms and flooding. You know, when your town or city uh, faces a crisis, it's the mayor who gets the first call. Uh, and uh, I've, I've seen it. I've traveled this country after floods and tornadoes, wildfires, hurricanes. As a matter of fact, I was kidding, but there's a serious piece to it when I pointed out that uh, to, to the governor, we got to stay, stop taking these helicopter rides, because I uh, went over this, I think it was the fifth one in the state, traveling the state. More of the, of the forest was burned down there up in Oregon than the entire state of, of, of uh, Missouri. I mean, it's a long, long, long way, a lot of damage. And I want to thank the mayors across the country for doing everything, everything they can to recover and rebuild. It matters that uh, the ones who you're the ones who make uh, sure, as, as trite as it sounds, that the garbage gets picked up, the potholes get fixed, the buses that you can catch to work and be able to continue to be there on time, and so much more of significant consequence. But those things are consequential. You affect people's quality of life more than any other group of people in the world. And mayors know the measure of success isn't how many partisan points you score, <clears throat> it's how many, how many problems you fix. Can you fix the problem? When I came to office, we had a lot of problems. The, uh... Can you hear me? The pandemic was raging, our economy was reeling, but we acted together. Now, two years in, it's clearer than ever that our plan's working. We're building the economy from the bottom up and the middle out, not just the top down. Because when we do that, by the way, the wealthy do very, very well. And everybody, the poor, have a shot, and the middle class can have a little breathing room. An economy that benefits uh, that folks in the heartland as well as in our cities and all across America. And, uh, you know, I remember, uh, you know, I, as I said, my, my family, I was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania. When Cole died when I was in third grade, we had to move. 
But I go back to Scranton. Everybody's the joke is they're from Scranton. Everybody's from Scranton. But think of all the towns you know, and some of you are mayors of, that you, they go through school, they want to stay where their family is, where their relatives are, where they know everything, and they have to say, Mama, got to leave. There's no jobs here. There's no jobs here in my town. I'm serious. I'm deadly earnest. And what we're trying to do is not just rebuild the economy, bring back the pride, the pride and the sense of belonging, the sense of I want to stay where I live, where I live now, where I'm able to do what I want to do. And that's the whole purpose of what we're trying to do in our cities when people used to move out. But, you know, now they're beginning to move back in. Cities are growing, not just big cities, small towns as well. The economy the rewards work where we don't need a college degree to provide for your family. It helps to have that college degree, but you don't need it to provide for your family. Two years ago this week, 18 million people were out of work. Two years ago this week. Now the nut number is under 1.6 million, near the lowest level in decades. <laughs> the unemployment rate is as low as it's been in 50 years. We've created 11 million jobs, 750,000 manufacturing jobs. Where in the hell is it written to say we can't be the manufacturing capital of the world in this? I mean it, not a joke. I got so sick and tired of us exporting jobs and importing product. We're now importing jobs and exporting product. That's what we're gonna do. That's what we're doing. I really mean it because we're beginning to invest in ourselves again because of you all. Over the last two years, more Americans applied to start a small business than any year in history, any year on record. They make up 50 percent of all the economy in America. Fewer families are facing foreclosure or an eviction before, than before the pandemic. Families in our communities are starting to breathe just a little bit easier. But folks, it's not only that. Pride is coming back to American communities and to American cities. And that's not just on the coast, as I said. It's in every part of the country, including many towns and cities and local communities that have been forgotten for much too long, much too long. And it's not an accident. It's a strategy. When I came to office, a strategy that we stuck to, even in the face of a lot of criticism, a strategy that we put into action, a strategy to recover and rebuild and invest in America. You know, hesitate a second to just digress a little bit. We used to invest 2% of our GDP in research and development every year. That's what we did in America. But then, long way, we stopped. We stopped investing in America in research and development. We invest now 7 tenths of 1%. We used to be number one. Now China is number two. We're number eight. You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's things we've allowed to happen. It's not been conscious. It just sort of slipped up on us. We just and the way in which we've changed the way we dealt with corporate law, a whole range of things. But we're changing it, and we're changing it. As I said, we're going to export product, not jobs. With your support, I signed the law of the American Rescue Plan to deliver immediate economic relief to families and communities that needed it most. <clears throat> One study found that before the law was passed, 70 percent of the mayors in America expected to cut critical jobs like teachers and transit workers. 27% of you were facing steep cuts in police department budgets. So we acted. And with the CARES Act, we passed under the previous administration, some of it had to go to your, you had to go to your legislatures for permission to get the money. I've been the bad guy when I was a senator and as vice president, a pain in the neck. Why do you have to go through the legislature? No, no, I'm serious. I'm deadly earnest about that. Because you go through the legislature, you can't blame them. They say, I want a piece of my district. But you can apply directly. Often I wrote the cops bill years ago. You didn't have to go to the legislature or governor to determine. You could apply directly. If you qualified, you got it directly. You got the money directly. Well, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> and things began to change. Instead, we made sure the American Rescue Plan empowered you directly, directly to avoid painful layoffs. You put cops back in the street, firefighters back in the jobs. You kept teachers in classrooms. You asked for the money and you qualified for it. In Knoxville, Tennessee, Mayor Kincannon gave premium pay. Is the mayor here? There you are, Mayor. Well, you gave premium pay to police officers and firefighters to keep them on the job. It was a big deal. All right, folks, you want to see all of that, simply go to the White House uh, YouTube channel 
Uh, go to whitehouse.gov. You want to see the full comments of President Biden. When we come back, we can talk about drama in Florida, how uh, Ron DeSantis is stoking white fear. That is going to be the GOP strategy for the next two years. Trust me, I'm telling you all that. So we'll discuss that next on Roland Martin on Culture on the Black Star Network. Don't forget, folks, I'm going to be in St. Louis tomorrow. In St. Louis area, Urban League, Michael McMillan, Tef Ho discussing white fear. The timing is absolutely great. Turnout, please, we want you all to come out. It's free and open to the public. Uh, you can RSVP uh, info at RolandSMartin.com info at RolandSMartin.com and of course you can get a copy of my book White Fear at all available bookstores download it on Audible you can also uh, get it from, from Amazon bars and other places as well go to a break I'll be right back we talk about blackness and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, rates $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Our legal roundtable is back in session as we look at yet another potential landmark case being considered by the United States Supreme Court. This one is called 303 Creative versus Alenis and may be the most important and far-reaching First Amendment, that is freedom of speech, case of our time. It could, depending on how the court rules, open the door for a return of Jim Crow segregation laws. It's true. If you say we can discriminate against one, you're saying we can discriminate against all. That's on the next Black Tape. Don't miss it. Right here on the Black Star Network. This is Judge Mathis. Hi, I'm Teresa Griffin. Hi, my name is Latoya Luckett, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> All right, folks, if you want to understand how shameful Ron DeSantis is, uh, the, the guy somehow wins even when he loses. A federal judge ruled today uh, that he did not have the authority uh, to intervene in a case where Ron DeSantis fired uh, a prosecutor so, so supposedly because he was woke. Um, and so it was Andrew Warren who he replaced in August and fired him. Uh, but the judge did rule that he violated Andrew Warren's right to free speech. Uh, and he also, uh, so uh, DeSantis' uh, administration said that he was fired for incompetence and willful defiance of his duties by implementing certain policies of presumptive non enforcement and by co signing a left leaning advocacy group's public statements. Well, guess what? The judge said that uh, the assertion that Mr. Warren neglected his duty or was incompetent is incorrect. This factual issue is not close. Running a state's attorney's office is the state's attorney's job, not the governor. The governor cannot properly suspend a state attorney based on policy differences. But again, the judge did not have the authority to weigh in. My panel, Michael Inhotep, as well as uh, civil rights attorney Matt Manning, glad to have you all on the show. Um, <clears throat> Matt, I want to go to you first. Because when you look at this decision by DeSantis when it came to the uh, African American Studies class, uh, this whole attack on woke woke stuff, this is stoking white fear. This is this is him 
trying to attack anybody and everybody when it comes to race, when it comes to DEI. Now you have these presidents of the state institutions coming out and saying that they uh, are not going to agree with anything dealing with diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are seeing how white fear is driving public policy there in Florida, and it's going to be how the GOP operates over the next few years. Yes, and how it's also driving it here in Texas and how it's driving it other places. And what it is is fear-mongering, and it's white fear. You're 100 percent right. And what's especially insane about this scenario is that so often you hear Republicans want to talk about whether someone was duly elected, right? That's been their whole life for Trump years. And Warren was elected twice. He's a great prosecutor. I've sat at a table with him before. He's passionate, and he's a brilliant guy. And for Ron DeSantis to think that he can just overstep the bounds of a, dual elect a duly elected prosecutor because he doesn't like his decision in terms of exercising his discretion is offensive, and it should concern everybody. I mean, when we get to the point where one uh, politician thinks they can oust another politician because they're not towing the line of their ideological position, that's terrifying if they're both duly elected, right? Because then what is the point of having elections whatsoever? So I, I just read a little bit about the judge's order, and this is kind of concerning because I understand the judge's position is probably he didn't want to take judicial activism, but, you know, when the governor doesn't have a right to do this, what is the recourse for Warren? And what is the recourse for anyone else who finds themselves at odds with some other politician's decision, you know, as it relates to their discretion? So I think this is absurd. I think this is what the GOP is going to start trying to do. I, in fact, I just heard that in Texas there is a, a bill to do something similar to give the legislature the power to give uh, district attorneys and others the power to attack DAs who won't prosecute certain offenses under the same kind of logic. So this is something that is sweeping across the nation and it's something that is extremely problematic. Uh, the thing that we need to understand here, uh, we need to understand here, uh, Michael, with how these guys are operating, is DeSantis is dismantling local governments uh, as well. Uh, this right. guy, he's targeting local politicians. He's targeting sheriffs and elections officials. That's what he's doing. Uh, and so, uh, look, he he overruled, he overruled, um, he overruled the, um, um, uh, the the congressional seats and said, fine, he drew his own in violation of the federal, federal law, and they still move forward. They don't care. They're that brazen. Absolutely. They, they don't care. This is a fight for raw, naked power. Um, this, this goes to... Uh, a number of different things. It goes to the uh, rise of the anti-critical race theory laws that are being uh, pushed by uh, dark money and pushed by uh, organizations like Moms for Liberty. Uh, it, it's being promoted by organizations like uh, Fox News. Uh, and this also goes to the fear of the browning of America, which we've talked about a number of times here on this show, Roland, and, and you do it in your book, White Fear, and how uh, by the year 2043, White people will no longer be the majority population in this country, and how they are, how there's a clamor to hold on to political power, but also to try to get, as 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 under Donald Trump it happened, trying to get as many conservative, ultra conservative federal judges confirmed, and as many ultra conservative, ultra conservative uh, judges on the Supreme Court confirmed, because they realize that they can control the the federal courts. OK, for the next 25, 30 years, then the judicial branch of the federal government interprets law from the legislative branch and policies from the executive branch of the federal government. So, um, you know, this is uh, more uh, and he's really acting like a dictator. DeSantis is acting like a little Trump. He's acting like the dictator of Florida. Uh, and then also, remember, you dealt with it here on, on this show, Roland, uh, the uh, the, I forgot what he called it, but it's like the the uh, voting Gestapo force that went out and arrested people uh, who are or who are former felons who were under the impression that they could vote legally and, and it was sent voter registrations in the car in, in the in the mail voter registration cards in the mail and then they send the police out to arrest them and say oh you voted illegally and then the judge throws out those cases okay or many of those cases so. Um, this is an example of how elections have consequences. People like Ron DeSantis have to be stopped at the ballot box. The thing, Matt, that I keep trying to explain to people, understand, Ron DeSantis 
is going to be very appealing to a lot of Republicans because he doesn't bring the crazy of Donald Trump. I'm warning people, this man can win. And trust me, Ron DeSantis is even more dangerous than a Donald Trump. Yeah, you're exactly right. He's more dangerous than Donald Trump because he's not bombastic and he is intelligent enough to at least try to uh, do things where he's got some kind of basis behind it. Whereas Trump, I mean, Trump made a lot of ridiculous decisions, but the reality is I think DeSantis is just considerably more insidious and I think he's got deeper plans. And I think to your point, he's more palatable to Republicans because they can look past Trump's you know, personal shortcomings and they can say, oh, here's a guy who is not as bad, he's not as objectionable, he's not out talking you know, in a degrading way about women or disabled people or any other contingent of people. And even though his ideology is insane, I mean, what this guy is doing is horrible, is trampling the Constitution, uh, they find him more palatable. And uh, partially, I think that's why he's doing some of this crazy stuff, because he knows Trump is running and he wants to have that leg up because obviously Trump's already come at his neck. And I think DeSantis is going to try to sell himself as the the true conservative who is the the moral conservative or whatever. And I think that that's what's going to happen is conservatives are going to galvanize behind him because they can get away from Trump finally, especially as he's embroiled in all these cases around the country. And, and Michael, when you look at he's targeting black folks and black voters mm -hmm. that better understand this is going to be a danger come 2024. Absolutely is a <laughs> absolutely is a danger come 2024. It's, it's a danger right now. You look at what he did with the, like I just said, you look at what he did with his with his uh, voter, voter Gestapo force. But also, people have to sit back, African Americans need to sit back and ask the question, right? If our vote didn't matter, why would they go through such measures to suppress our vote? And if you if you understand the history of Florida, 1868, the Florida State Constitution, what they did was they imposed felony disenfranchisement laws. This is where it goes back to. The fight that Desmond Meade had that you documented here on this show, Roland, that goes back to 1868, three years after the Civil War ended. African Americans were 48 percent of the population of the state of Florida. They imposed the, the state, the, the state legislature imposed this felony disenfranchisement law to target African Americans because they feared a Negro legislature. They knew we would vote vote a lot of these white supremacists out of office, and they expanded the crimes that were classified as felonies as well to lock us out of political power. So if you understand the history and, uh, and, and your understanding of politics is directly related to your understanding of history. If you're ignorant of history, you're going to be ignorant of politics. All you have to do is study the history of Florida, and you can see why they're doing what they're doing today and why we have to fight and vote these people out of office and keep them out of office. You're absolutely right. And so, again, uh, there are a lot of people uh, who sat on the sidelines in Florida who did not vote. Uh, there are people mm -hmm. there who are upset. There are people who are saying, well, you know what? This is a lost cause. But I'm, try I'm trying to warn people. I'm trying to warn people. Folks, what they want to do, Axios did a story. They have studied the four years under Trump, and they had looked at all the mistakes they made and the plan that they have in place. If they win it back in 2024, is to gut the gut the federal government. They will fire thousands of civil servants. They want to impose. What, if you want to talk about the Taliban, uh, mm -hmm. talk about the Taliban. They want to impose a similar ideology here in the United States, and it's dressed up under conservatism. So, folks, you can sit on the sidelines all you want, to, but they are targeting black people. Absolutely. They are targeting black people. All right, I got to go to a break. We're going to come back with more on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Don't forget, uh, support us in what we do. Uh, and look, we've got nominated for the NAACP Image Award. Be sure to go to vote.naacpimageawards.net and you can cast your ballot uh, to vote for our show for our standing news special. Uh, it's open to the public. Anybody can vote. Uh, just simply go to that category, look for Roland Martin Unfiltered, and then uh, what you simply do is uh, you fill that ballot out and then uh, you can open one email per ballot. If you've got five emails, you can vote five times. But so please help us out to win this Image Award, our first nomination uh, here at Roland Martin Unfiltered. I'll be right back.
on the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie. People can't live with them, can't live without them. Our relationships often have more ups and downs than a boardwalk roller coaster, but it doesn't have to be that way. Trust your gut. Whenever your gut is like, this isn't healthy, this isn't right, I don't like the way that I'm being treated. This goes for males and females. Trust your gut, and then whenever that gut feeling comes, have a conversation. Knowing how to grow or when to go, a step-by-step guide on the next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, we're talking about the difficulty of being able to acquire wealth for Black Americans. My guest, Emily Flitter, is the author of The White Wall, How Big Finance is Bankrupting Black America. The bad stuff that you feel when you're dealing with the financial services industry is not your fault. It's not your fault and you don't deserve to be treated like this. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. What's up, y'all? I'm Will Packer. I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, welcome back to Roller Martin Unfiltered. We've been talking about this issue of race in uh, America. And uh, we were just, of course, talking about what's been happening in Florida with the DeSantis administration. Um, but I want to talk about something that, and I posted it on my Instagram page, and I raised this issue about the lack of black PR companies uh, in the United States. And the reason I raised that particular point is because I talked about how, how you don't have a major black PR company. Here we talk about black media company as well. Part of the problem is we are small. We are way too small. We have all these small companies. We don't have scale. I want to bring in Michael and Matt in on this because uh, the, the reason I'm raising this issue is here we are. We talk, we're talking about how do we build black America? How do we grow black America? And the bottom line is uh, Matt and Michael. We're not going to be able to build and grow Black America as long as when you look at the sectors in which we are operating in business-wise, we are small. Pre-COVID, there were 2.6 million Black-owned businesses. 2.5 million had one employee. So truth be told, we only really have 100,000 Black-owned businesses. 95% of all Black-owned businesses same thing. It comes down to size. I'm trying to get people to understand we can't just say, hey, I own the business. It means nothing if you're small. Yeah. Um, you know, Roland, this is uh, something extremely important. We talked about this some um, yesterday on Faraji Muhammad's show, The Culture. Um, we don't really understand, understand scaling. There, there, there was there the past maybe 10, 15 years, there's been so much emphasis on starting businesses, starting businesses. I've seen, you know, numerous workshops on entrepreneurship, trying to get African-Americans to start businesses. There's been less emphasis on changing the mindset of African-Americans to, one, support African-American-owned businesses so that they can grow, so they can scale, so they can increase revenue, hire more employees, number one. Number two, Two, something else is extremely important, and and you know this rolling from coming from a family that actually owned a catering company. Um, other ethnic groups will employ family members and start businesses with family members, right? But there's a narrative going around that you don't go into business with family, you don't hire family members, and a lot a lot of times that's directed towards African Americans. But when you look at other cultures. They don't live by that. You go into Chaldean stores, Arab stores, Asian American stores, Chinese, Mexicans, they got the whole family working there, okay? And they pull the resources together that the families have to help create generational wealth, all right? Now, you want to make sure that you put the right person in the right position, 
give them the right responsibilities based upon their skill sets. But this has to be a total reprogramming of how we look at business, how we engage business. And it's not enough to say start business or build your own, which is one of the most overused cliches, build your own. But there also has to be an emphasis on supporting consistently spending dollars with Black-owned businesses to keep them in business and help them grow. But, but, but so here's the deal, uh, uh, Matt, that I want people to understand. I'm going to say something, and it's probably about to piss a lot of people off. And that is, many of us have lifestyle jobs, lifestyle businesses. Now, let me explain that. What that means is, again, I'm going to go back to pre-COVID. 2.6 million Black-owned businesses, 2.5 million had one employee. And those Black-owned businesses were doing, on average, $54,000 in revenue. When we had 1.9 mm -hmm. million Black-owned businesses, they were doing, on average, $110,000 in revenue. So the reality is, when we talk about Black-owned businesses, in many cases, we, are, we have businesses where we're simply just paying ourselves a paycheck, and we're actually not building and creating wealth. We're actually not building a, a business that you can actually create scale and then pass on to a family member. The reality is, uh, we should be able to be building businesses. And again, if we choose not to sell, then all of a sudden, a family member is taking over a 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar a year business, but that's not what's happening. And so, so the problem that I'm, I'm looking at, we are having conversations and people keep saying to Michael's point, build your own, build your own, but folk don't even understand what building your own means. I really believe we've got to have a much more rigorous conversation that I would say this here. I would say we have, I don't, I, I don't even want to say let's get more black owned businesses. I keep right. saying let's get more black owned businesses with scale. Let's say if you got three small PR firms merge into one PR firm. Uh, I've said this about black newspapers. It is stupid in some cities. You've got five, six or seven black newspapers. The, you simply cannot, the, 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 the audience can't support that when you got one daily newspaper that's struggling to survive. I, I just really believe that we're going to have to deal with people's ego about merging and mergers and acquisition in order to impact Black America. Because when you have scale, you now can go after multi million dollar contracts. Now you can hire more people. Now you can pay mm -hmm. them competitive salaries. And that is a fundamental problem that I see in Black America across all industries. Yeah, and you know what's interesting? As you talked about that, I kind of thought about the analogy with churches because you see that a lot with Black churches as well, right? Where you have very small membership and it's so small that it's like unsustainable for each individual church, whereas you could have one church uh, with people came together and have a, a robust body. Obviously, we're talking about businesses, but the principle is the same. And I think you hit the nail on the head about coming together and putting aside that ego. I do have questions. I mean, I'm a lawyer, not an economist, so I don't know the answer to this, but I do have questions about the institutional barriers to scale. And I know we've talked about that on the, the show before, but you know, really the question is how readily do we have access to SBA money? I know there's a lot of money out there, but Surely there are some institutional things that play into that, not only racism and buying attitudes, but just yep. access to capital, right? And we have to address that but, issue. The other but, thing, but, though, but, 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 but hold on, hold on, hold on. Let, let me address that particular point, uh, because that is important. But in many ways, it's not necessarily access to capital, because the reality is, if you have one business that's doing very well, uh, and then another business, if you're looking at what their debt to, to debt to equity ratio is in terms of what their revenue is, things along those lines. Uh, the, the, so you, to, to the point you made about the churches, now I'm saying, okay, I don't have two staffs. I don't have two office buildings. I don't, I don't, I don't have, I don't have, uh, I don't have, you know, the, 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 the multiple in terms of expenses. Now I'm able to compete much more effectively. I just think that what's happening is we're so small. Mm -hmm. that, and we got a bunch of small little silos that can't build anything. And so scale comes in when you're able to compete for larger contracts. And so versus having 20 black websites, you go from 20 to two, 
Now, all of a sudden, your revenue may go from two or three million to eight to 10 to 15 to 20 million. And now that's a game changer. Yeah, we, yeah. we, we really have to think on oh, that. No, 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 uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry. Go to Michael. Go to Michael. Oh, I'm go back sorry. to Matt. You want to finish the no, second okay. point? I mean, I, I'll yield to Michael. I was just going to say that I think part of it, too, though, is I think sometimes the industries that we're in, I know we're talking about the PR context, but a lot of times I feel like black people are investment in investments that are very difficult. For instance, restaurants, right? You know, it's hard yep. to scale yep. a restaurant as is compared to something where you're providing a professional service. And that's not to knock yep. anyone, but I mean, I think also a diversification of the industries somewhere like media, like mm. PR or practicing law or medicine or whatever allows you to potentially scale with more offices and practices and you're not necessarily tied to the economy in the same way that you might be if you have uh, you have to buy you know inventory and that kind of thing so I, I'm sure that factors in somewhere yeah and 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 that and that and again it, it goes to what what are we going what are the businesses that we're going into that are impacting our community uh, that right there to me is what I'm trying to get us to be t to talk about and, and I can tell you Michael I've spoken at numerous Black Chambers of Commerce event, and rarely is mergers and acquisitions on the menu. Uh, I, I said it many times. when I launched, Before I launched this show, I went to every major Black-owned media company to partner because what I was doing, none of them were doing, and not one wanted to partner. Okay, fine. You leave me no choice. I didn't, I didn't want to have to do it, but that's what I had to do. Yeah, uh, two really important points on this, Roland. Um, I, I used to manage African-American companies that had uh, government contracts, city of Detroit, county of Wayne, the state of Michigan. And, um, uh, and you know, when Kwame Kilpatrick was mayor here in Detroit, uh, one of the things he was trying to do, and I, I didn't agree with all of his political stances, but one of the things he was really trying to do was to get more African-American-owned businesses to be uh, contractors for the city of Detroit. Because there's something like uh, about $2 billion in contracts that go out each year in the city of Detroit, okay? Um, so he held a—his uh, uh, administration organized a one-day summit down at Cobo Hall, downtown Detroit, where—and uh, and people could come in to find out how to be contractors of the— uh, city of Detroit and get contracts, especially African American African American owned businesses. And he was trying to demystify the whole process. And one of the things he talked about is that many of our businesses were going to have to merge together to pull their resources together to be able to get these contracts, okay, and to be able to, to stay in business and prosper. Um, and unfortunately, in the African American community, a lot of times that's something that's not necessarily taught. OK, so that has to be taught once. Secondly, very quickly, um, when we study the history of African-American entrepreneurship, successful African-American entrepreneurship here in this country, going back decades, even going back into slavery, we see that we utilize the cooperatives, the co-ops. And if people read Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard's book, who's like one of the top authorities on the history of African-American co-ops, it's called Collective Courage, Collective Courage in right. History of, of African American economic uh, thought and practice, and it deals with uh, organizations like the Colored Merchants Association, which was a cooperative of hundreds of African American owned grocery stores in the early 1900s, and they organized so that they, they could get economies of scale, they could learn better accounting practices, marketing practices, so right. they could better compete against the white chain stores like the Kresge's and, and the Woolworths. So we have to go back into that history and see how we were able to compete back then. So, let's, so let me say this here. The um, uh, federal government spends $5.6 billion on contracts. Blacks get $1.6 Seven percent, um, uh, which is about nine billion. President Biden spoke to the CDCF, and he said uh, they want that to, to go to you know a hundred billion. Well, guess what? That's going to be real, real tough. You got no plan of action. And what I'm saying, people, you're going to hear us talk about this a lot more on this show. Is you go, I think you go for the money that's sitting there right now. Federal contracts, right. state contracts, county contracts, city contracts, contracts. Because if we don't we're not going to be able to achieve what we want economically. All right, folks, hold tight one mm -hmm. second. We come back. We're going to talk about uh, the Biden administration's focus on fair housing policy. Uh, that's the next on Roland Martin, the Black Star Network.
Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. An hour of living history with Dr. Richard Mariba Kelsey, thinker, builder, author, and one of the most important and impactful elders in the African-American community. He reflects on his full and rich life and shares his incomparable wisdom about our past, present, and future. The African genius is, is, is saying that my uncle was a genius, my brother was a genius, my neighbor was a genius. I think we ought to drill that in ourselves and move ahead rather than believing that I got it. That's next on The Black Table, here on the Black Star Network. Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I gotta tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. The people don't really wanna have this conversation. No, they don't. What's up, everybody? It's Godfrey, the funniest dude on the planet. <laughs> Hi, I'm Israel Houghton. Apparently, the other message I did was not fun enough. So this is fun. You are watching... Roland Martin, my man, unfiltered. In 1968, the Civil Rights Act was passed, also known as the Fair Housing Act. That act was designed uh, to get rid of discrimination in the housing industry. It really was a practice that was put in place by realtors in this country uh, to keep black folks from uh, living in white neighborhoods. It was so pervasive uh, that it really limited African Americans from also being able to build and create wealth. Now. We have seen uh, that uh, over the last 50 some odd years, that has continued. 
uh, in this country. You still have lawsuits that exist where people are being locked out, where you have realtors uh, who, are ask, who, are, uh, who are pushing African Americans uh, to uh, buy homes in non-white areas. Now, there are those who may be watching who say, well, uh, why do you want to live in a white area? Because it also comes down to the value of homes. We've seen appraisers and the stories where uh, they will give a low appraisal to a home that clearly uh, somebody black lives there. They will look at uh, the art on their wall or books, look at pictures, and we've seen where African Americans uh, have uh, removed a number of those items, and guess what happens? They get a high appraisal. So the bottom line is we still continue to see in America racism in the housing industry. Now, uh, President Obama, uh, they had a plan to require cities to turn in their plans of action to how to end segregated housing. But then the Trump folks came in and then they blew that out, saying that that plan was going to somehow destroy the suburbs in this country. Well, if you know how the suburbs were created, you will realize that was all about white flight. Where were they running from? The Fair Housing Act of 1968. And so that's really how the suburbs blew up. It was white flight. Well, now the Biden administration is moving forward with that same plan, requiring cities to submit their plans of action to end segregated housing in this country. Now, using the force of uh, the Housing and Urban Development Department, they're, they're reintroducing the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, okay? Uh, this rule, of course, requires state, cities, and public housing agencies seeking federal funds to complete a comprehensive assessment explaining how housing segregation exists in their communities and what their plan is to address it. Again, it was restored in 2021, but the new version will simplify and emphasize goal setting. Uh, it was first introduced again by the Obama administration in 2015, repealed by Trump's folks. Now, Secretary Marsha Hudge uh, issued a statement says emphasizing housing equality in this new rule. This proposed rule is a major step towards fulfilling the law's full promise and advancing our legal, ethical, and moral cha ch cha charge to provide equitable access to opportunities for all. The rule received support from more than 30 national racial justice and housing organizations. Joining us uh, now from uh, for, is Demetria uh, Sponsor. She's the Vice President and Director of Federal Policy at the Center for Responsible Lending. Glad to have you here. See, see the, the thing that a lot of people don't understand, if you, if you want to understand housing in America, understand it's about money. And so even though the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, we, we continue to have problems truly having equity in this country when it comes to housing and the law. Yeah, most definitely. One thing that I would say is it's really important to recognize that the federal government not only supported or encouraged the private market, uh, to discriminate uh, against people of color, they mandated it by law. Um, so it was true that you could not get uh, a VA or an FHA loan um, if you did not live in an all-white neighborhood, right? So it is federal policy that has actually led to uh, uh, much of the racial segregation and the disproportionate gap in home ownership um, and, and safe and clean and, and, and nice housing um, in communities of color. Um, and so I think the affirmative fur affirmatively furthering fair housing rule is a recognition of the fact that the federal government has an obligation to use its funds to correct and remedy the errors, uh, the harms that it has caused, um, and that states and localities, uh, when they receive those funds, need to do just that. Uh, and look, the, the, the power of the federal government is the purse. We've seen this. Uh, when they wanted to increase the drinking age in this country from 18 to 21, what did the federal government say? They said, hey, states, it's all good. You can do whatever you want, but you can't qualify for federal transportation dollars if you don't raise your drinking age from 18 to 21. And there's no state in America that can actually have roads, bridges, uh, and new highways without those federal funds. Now, Louisiana sold a whole bunch of alcohol. They were the last state to actually change their law. But this is how you use federal power. You withhold the dollars. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think that this has the potential to be a very powerful and transformative role. The other thing that I think is really important is that it includes a requirement uh, that states and localities actually work with the community 
uh, in developing the plan. And so these plans, these equity plans under the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule will actually be subject to community input, comment, and feedback. Um, and that is a change from the original Obama rule that was proposed um, that will allow for more community involvement. Um, Michael uh, and Matt, uh, with questions. Matt, you first. Yeah, so the question I have is what, if any, sanctions are there if a city or a locality submits a plan and then is found to still be engaging in discrimination or allowing it to occur in their city or municipality? What are the sanctions for that? Well, so I'm glad that you asked that question, uh, because one of the, the criticisms of the 2015 rule under the Obama administration is that it required those plans, but there were no enforcement mechanisms. Um, and so you didn't have uh, any kind of accountability on the part of uh, states and localities when they use the funds. Um, under this proposed rulemaking, uh, what's going to happen is that uh, consumers, individuals, and community members will actually be able to file complaints with HUD um, regarding whether or not the state or locality is actually enforcing the plan. In addition, it increases the accountability and monitoring mechanisms that HUD will take um, in reviewing the specific measures that, that the states and localities are, are undertaking uh, to use their or to implement their equity plan. Thank you. Michael. All right. Okay. Um, so thanks for coming on, uh, Matria, and sharing this information with us. And this deals with a lot of history as well. Um, when we look at the history, for instance, of racial covenants, racial restrictive covenants here in this country that were written into the deeds of white people's homes and stated that they could not uh, sell their homes to someone who was non-white, especially African-American. This helped to lock a lot of African-Americans out of generational wealth. Uh, even though those are illegal, they still exist today. Can you talk about how we can fight against this? Uh, because this has been one of the ways that we've been locked out of uh, generational wealth in this country for decades. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's a really good uh, point. Well, the, the Fair Housing Act is one of the ways that we actually fight against that. Um, and we need strong enforcement, which is something that we're seeing more so under this administration than obviously we saw in the prior administration. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is that one of the reasons why restrictive covenants were so problematic goes back to the point of the federal government's policies. So even after mm -hmm. the Fair Housing Act was actually passed, the federal government said, going forward, we will not permit, uh, you know, people to include restrictive covenants and accept, you know, and, and, and use government financing. However, that does not apply to a property that already exists that had a pre-existing restrictive covenant, right? Right. Um, right? And so this is how federal policy has led to uh, and intensified uh, the discrimination that has happened in the United States against people of color and our access, quite frankly, to safe housing, affordable housing, and the ability to gen generate wealth through home ownership. Um, so the way that we change that is, is twofold. We have to have strong enforcement of the Fair Housing Act. Um, strong enforcement of anti-discrimination laws. Uh, we have to increase the ability of private sector individuals to be able to sue um, and sue effectively um, uh, institutions that are engaging in discriminatory practices like racially restrictive covenants. Um, we also have to hold financial institutions accountable for redlining policies uh, and making loans to only certain communities or pushing steering loans uh, for people of color into certain communities. And that's a practice that still is very much alive today, as we've seen with some settlements uh, with some well-known financial institutions. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Is there anything in this announcement that you believe should be strengthened? So I think the enforcement mechanisms could be stronger. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I applaud the administration for doing uh, for, for taking the step of saying, you know what, it's not enough for us to propose these plans, to monitor these plans, but we need to have a mechanism uh, to, to enforce these plans. Um, I would like to see a little bit more, uh, I think, meat around what that enforcement mechanism looks like. Um, and so what happens uh, when an individual or community member files a complaint? Um, and what is the process? Is there a timeline in which HUD, HUD will respond? and investigate that complaint. And I think those are things that, uh, as we think about this proposed rule, uh, we should all have an opportunity to comment and weigh in. Because again, to your point, Roland, uh, the power is the, the, the power of the purse. Um, and so ultimately, uh, the, the, the requirement is only as strong as the threat that individuals and institutions will lose public funds, lose federal dollars, if they do not engage in the activity. 
Uh, I keep telling people, follow the money. If you ain't focused on the money, we're not having an American conversation. Uh, Mitria Spotser, I certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, folks, got to go to a break. We'll be back on Roland Martin Unfiltered. But don't forget to support us in what we do. First of all, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button, y'all. You're sitting here watching. It's, uh, come on, hit the button. We need to be over 1,000 likes, okay? Also, download the Black Shirt Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Support us in what we do, joining the Bring the Funk fan club, send check of money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 2003. 7-0196, Cash App, Dollar Sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R Martin Unfiltered, Venmo, RM Unfiltered, Zell, Roland at RolandSMartin.com, Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you what you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Carl Payne pretended to be Roland Martin. Holla! You are watching Roland Martin, and I'm on his show today, and it's what, huh? You should have some chew cards. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. E. All right, folks, uh, we talked to Dr. Rowe the other day about uh, proper eating, and we had a part two that we taped with our panel, and so we wanted to share that with you as we focus on a new you in 2023. All right, folks, we're talking about better food choices uh, for a new you in 2023, chatting with Dr. Rowe. Got our panel from uh, Tuesday's show uh, with some questions. Let's see. We'll start with Skinny Jason. <laughs> so, Doc, here's the deal. How we bulk Jason up? He's 180 pounds. He's skinny as hell. He, Jason, Jason is malnourished. <laughs> what? Why He's do, malnourished. How do you call him? He's malnourished. He's, ja ja Jason, is, is that your opinion that you're malnourished? Jason, no, he's too damn skinny. I'm, I'm not too skinny. I'm in great shape. I look good. I got my abs. I'm looking great. Um, but I do have a question, particularly about my favorite kind of green food, which is Brussels sprouts. Oh, hell no. What did he say? Brussels sprouts is his favorite green food. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, my God. My wife yeah. cooks My I, wife cooks Brussels sprouts. That's like smelling chitlins in the house. Uh, my my the, question is... Brussels... I well, like they give off the gas Brussels. like cabbage, they, like they cabbage stink. does. They, cabbage give off the, they give off the gas like cabbage. But um, they are... It's another cruciferous vegetable that is super good for you, Jason. So keep eating your Brussels sprouts. All right, what's your question, so, Jason? Is, is, it, is it still healthy if I fry the Brussels sprouts? This he is asking. Okay, no, no, no. This, so this is the thing. This is, is it a, still is, healthy if no, I no, fry no. the Brussels sprouts? Flash fry, flash fry, which means you're going to put them in the oil for a small amount of time and take hold them up, out. Hold up, hold up, hold up. So, Jason, how do you, how do you fry them? Uh, I put some olive oil. I usually chop up some onions. I put that in there. 
You know, I like to get him a little, you know, a little brown, sometimes a little he crispy. He ain't flash frying. He, he, he deep frying. <laughs> See, right there. You How, how long your how long you fry your Brussels sprouts? Uh, I say, like, seven, eight minutes. And that sounded to me, though, like you're sautéing. It sounded more like you're sautéing. No, he frying. Right? No, he frying. Yeah? So he frying. I his ass. Know. Were you his there? Ass, no, his Were ass frying. There? See, he trying to tell you something. He done... Listen, Doc, <laughs> I've been doing this long enough. Okay. Somebody give you the right answer, uh -huh. and then when you when you know that, they say, like, nah, like, well, I kind of do this, do that. Uh, no, he asked about frying Brussels sprouts. Well, here's the thing. So, Jason, are your Brussels sprouts submerged in oil? How long are they, when you say, when they come out, are they green or brown? They have a, some green left in them, but you know they. You they want you want some, so so you're trying to get the leaves crispy. Is that correct? I do like some of them to be. You crispy. want some yeah. of it, yeah? No, dog. Nah, he frying Brussels sprouts. And the extra virgin olive oil that you're using is a good fat, so that's a good heart protecting fat. So good on you. Just keep the oil. Just just keep okay. it down. Okay. He said seven, eight minutes. Yeah. How long should he be leaving them Brussels sprouts in there? He's well. He's. He's really sautéing. No, he's not. Doc, <laughs> he, doc he frying. It's, uh, Dude, really? he, he got some deep-fried-ass Brussels sprouts. He ain't fooling me. <laughs> how, long, how long they should be? You said, you said, a, you said light, you said a quick fry? I said, I said a flash fry. You said a fry. flash fry. A how flash long is that? Fry. So a flash fry is in for about four or five minutes. Got it. Jason, yeah. you about four damn minutes too long. <laughs> you you deep-frying your Brussels sprouts. You ain't fooling me. I know. Well, he's not deep-frying unless he's put unless he has this much oil and, and the Brussels sprouts are submerged in that. That's not Doc, what's happening. Doc, Am I he right? He's deep-frying, Doc. I'm telling you, he's deep-frying. That, that is right. Question. Yeah, okay. He's so lying. He's lying. He deep-frying. All right, Randy. I have a similar question. When you cook greens a long time, like some collard greens, right, and you you know, let them simmer for a long time and get that, you know, smoky flavor from the meat. Do you lose all of the, any nutrients that were in there? Can you cook them so long that they're new, there's no nutrients left? So I love this question because, you know, this is what black folks do. You ain't right? lying. This is what this like is. Like fried we, Brussels sprouts. This is what the culture does, right? <laughs> I don't want you, so in answer to your question, yes, you do. You, you lose a lot of, you, you know, vitamins to the water. That's the reason why we have what they call pot liquor. You, your grandmother or, or old folks in your, yeah, in your family, you drink the pot liquor. It's because all of those nutrients are leached into the water. I don't, I don't even want you to cook your greens in a large amount of water. I want you to cook your greens in extra virgin olive oil with a small amount of water, which is more like sauteing them. Um, and it's also a good way, and a good way to do this is you don't add meat either. These see, are, I, see, I was gonna go back to that question. You know, at, there's she no slid, meat. Hold up, Doc. Uh, Randy, what meat you put in your greens? Smoked turkey. Okay, so like, a lot of people use smoked turkey. Smoke turkey. Damn well, she ain't putting no smoked turkey. See, because <laughs> they, 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 they get extra healthy on the show, and you know they ain't putting no smoked turkey. She got some bacon in there. She got some pork. You know you got... I would oh. say let's take out the fat back, but you didn't say that you use fat back, and you didn't say that she, you use ham. She ain't you she said, want you telling her take it out. You said that you use that you use smoked turkey, and smoked turkey every once in uh, every once in a while is good. But try this: try extra virgin olive oil. So put your greens in a, a hot pan, one that you've already warmed. Right. Put you know put about two. Um, silver dollars, or two fifty cent pieces worth of olive oil, depending on the amount of greens you have. If it's a whole uh, bunch, then you might have to do a little bit more. And then only a cup of water. Try, start it. Start it there with a cup of water. Get your greens to be uh, wilted. So just work with the greens so that they're wilted, and then meaning softened. Right. Keep doing that. Here's what you're gonna add. You're gonna add. Um, red pepper flakes or cayenne pepper. You're going to add a little salt. Um, no hot at sauce? The end, once oh, the what did you say? What did you say, what did you say Randy? No, no hot sauce? You said no hot sauce. No, no, I'm getting this. You can do hot sauce, but what I want okay. you to do is okay. squeeze lemon juice at the end. Serve a wedge of lemon with your green squeeze, a little lemon juice through your hot sauce, and it's going to be amazing for you. And you won't have used any meat whatsoever. No fat back, Randy. 
Try it. Let me know how it turns Randy, out. Randy, no fat I back. Will. Thank no you so damn much. well. Negro to my smoked turkey. You know you're gonna be using no smoked turkey in there. Mustafa, I go. Promise you. <laughs> Dr. Rowe, you know, uh, folks are starting to travel a lot more now. I'm on an airplane every couple of days. How do we make sure that we have this the healthy eating? Uh, when we're traveling. Oh, what you're in line. What when, you you're, when you're traveling, healthy eating, like for instance, I mean, I was I was doing very well for the first uh, first two weeks. Flew to Houston, quick trip, up late, up early, and then when I flew to Wichita on Sunday, flight was delayed. I was supposed to get in at 10:15, got in at after got midnight, hotel at 1:30, mm -hmm. only sleep five hours, flew back, came oh, back at midnight. This is a nightmare. And so, well, but what happened? And again, so your your options really are limited when, when you're flying. So unless you take some food with you, unless you take some food with you, so right. But but when you but when you like. Going. Uh, when, when it, you it, can. It ain't when you, when so, you, yeah. Okay, so what do you take? So, th so, so uh, I don't want to say tuna in a pouch, which is what I would normally do because you'll stink up the plane. So, <laughs> that's out. <laughs> so, so, I don't want to do that. That's like having but, Brussels sprouts. But that would have been, that's, it's a great option if you're not in, in an enclosed space, right? Uh, that's out with yeah. a plane, dog. We ain't but, flying private. Right, but get yourself some sliced chicken, get yourself some sliced turkey, put it in a baggie, right? So that, that's healthy protein, and it's going to help to boost your metabolism, and it's going to give you some energy, okay? So do that. Get yourself some nuts. Take fruit. You can always do fruit. Okay. Fresh. You can take canned, even if you need to do that, in its own juice or in water. So, uh, but you want whole foods. You want um, sustainable foods that are going to get you through through your trip. There are options. Many, you know, most airports now have healthy options from salads to well, sandwiches. Well, 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 first Many of all, again, do. again, it all depends on what time. Because so part, so part of the issue, and I guarantee Mustafa is the same way as I am. Mm -hmm. What happens is when you have your early flights, yeah. when you, when you, anything that's really before 7.30, you gotta take in, your lot, own in a lot of ways you're screwed. You gotta okay? take your own food. Uh, but then, and then, uh, since COVID, a lot of places, food places have shut down at 7. Yeah. So you might be landing at 8, 8.30, 9 or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and if it's not Atlanta airport or somewhere like this here, your food options are severely limited. Uh, and so I know exactly what he's talking about. I, I, I would say, uh, you know, the, the, I would still say, Mustafa, anybody who's watching, the biggest thing is, is really, even though you're traveling, avo still avoiding the processed foods, avoiding the chips and the cookies. And take and, your and own. You, what you, because you can replace those take, chips take and what, cookies take, with, take, trail, take, with trail mix with your own I thought you were about to say, take your own chips and cookies. No, I was no, like, no, oh, no. damn. I was you, like, all right. No, you can replace the chips and cookies with tra with a healthy trail mix, one that you make yourself or one that you buy, you know, but okay, throw those in your bag. I don't do trail throw, mix. Do your, see, you don't do a lot. So throw- oh, your, I, I have a very limited palate throw that, your that's nuts, fine, but- throw, get, get yourself some, some dried or, or raw nuts and throw those in a bag. You can also throw your popcorn, you can throw fruit, whatever your options are, whatever you like, what you I, know you're gonna get trapped in, a, in an airport. Right. So what I just then do then make sure that you walk with your food. So so one thing we stopped that I've also did done is uh, I'll ca I'll bring my protein shakes with me. Then that way I can grab a banana or some other fruit and I got I got that with me. Or at the end of the day, if I if I just need if, if I keep it real simple, mm -hmm. salad, salmon, or salad and chicken. I, I keep it real. That's, so and I, that's, I, I, listen. I keep it I keep it real simple because. And because again, it can get real quick when you like, man, them ribs looking good, or you, or because because you know that that bacon burger, uh, and it's looking it's looking real good. But 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 that's one of the things. And it happened the other day. I had very limited options, so I had a meal I didn't want to eat, mm -hmm. but I did eat three of them. Okay. Meaning it wasn't like. Uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then a flight tomorrow. Oh, so and you so had, you ate something that wasn't so I, on your plan. Huh, right. That wasn't on the plan, but, I but you only went, okay, that's right. good, that's good. And that's what you call planning for, you know, those times when you're in a crunch, or planning for times when you go off the rail. Sometimes people go off the rail just because they want to go off yep. the rail, right? 
So when you go off the rail, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to fall into the posture of, oh, I might as well. Uh, you, uh, you, you, you remember last week, Randy? Randy wanted some Cheetos last week uh -huh. uh, with Jim Jones Look at on. Telling. No, He's no, telling. no, we were on the air, so everybody heard it. Okay. So we had to explain to Randy, no, you can't have your cheat snack because your cheat snack going to come into your cheat meal, mm. and a cheat meal going to go to a cheat day, yes. and a cheat day going to turn to a cheat weekend. Yes, yes. Yeah, I don't want you to fall into the might as well <laughs> posture. Right. The might, oh, I might as well. You had right. a sliver of the cheesecake, and you knew that wasn't on your plan, and the next thing you know, you have the whole cheesecake. Or cheesecake for the next three days. Right. I don't you want go. you to fall into the might as well posture, yep. because here's what I need you to do. Ten seconds. I want you to, I want you to just make your next decision your best decision. There you go. All right, which means, Jason, no damn fried Brussels sprouts. Stop fronting. <laughs> and Randy, get that fat back out of your green. Stop fronting as well. All right. God, bro, 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 get, people, the get, book, information from you. get the book. Get my book is new out in paperback. Get 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 drrow.com. Go to get drrow.com. Okay. Get the book. Get your meal plans. Get your exercises on. Cool. Get your meditations on. This is a life plan, one that can take you through the rest of your life. And cuss people out to lower your blood pressure. All right, Dr. Rowe, we appreciate it. We'll be right back. Rolling Martin Unfiltered on the Blackstone Network. Jackie, people can't live with them, can't live without them. Our relationships often have more ups and downs than a boardwalk roller coaster, but it doesn't have to be that way. Trust your gut. Whenever your gut is like, this isn't healthy, this isn't right, I don't like the way that I'm being treated, this goes for males and females. Trust your gut, and then whenever that gut feeling comes, have a conversation. Knowing how to grow or when to go, a step-by-step -step guide on the next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. What's up, y'all? I'm Will Packer. I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, 12 year old Alicia Ortiz Fenwick left for school on Wednesday, January 18th, before leaving for school uh, on the uh, uh, block of uh, South 49th Street, did not return her Philadelphia home. Uh, she is five feet tall, weighs 130 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. She was last seen wearing white, blue, and black tights, a red shirt, and a black jacket. Anyone with information about Alicia Ortiz Fenwick is asked to contact the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Police Department at 215-686-3183, 215-686-3183. Uh, man, that's uh, certainly uh, a sad, sad story right there. Um, all right, folks, do we have the video of this white man who lost his mind in Georgia? Uh, Douglasville, Georgia, so a black FedEx driver delivering packages, uh, and this white man decided to just show his whole ass. Hit play. You stupid monkey. Come on, hey, say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Go ahead, get out, you fucking dumb nigga. I'm fucking what? Are you a dumb nigger? <laughs> Go ahead, park. You want me to want to fuck around with a white man? You run over my dog, I will show Ain't you. Ain't nobody running over nothing. Black Lives Matter. 
Hey, welcome to Facebook. You think I give a fuck, nigga? Hey, what's up, though? Uh, now, uh, they're still trying to uh, identify who this guy is. Trust me, uh, you know, Twitter is going to uh, do the work uh, as best that they can uh, as relates to who, uh, who this fool is. Uh, and, of course, you know that, that account Tizzy ENT, uh, uh, the guy who's always reporting on them. Uh, in fact, uh, he posted a video. I mean, you know, let me go and just play this real quick. Uh, he posted a video uh, about this. Give me one second. I think we have it. Uh, y'all seeing? Y'all see my phone here? Okay, go ahead and take no, take no, my I didn't iPhone. Say it again. Oh, you gotta love that freedom of speech. I do have something of an update with this. That young man, the FedEx driver, uh, he has legal counsel, and they just did this. So we just left Douglas County Sheriff's Office filed an incident report trying to get criminal charges against the assailant that is assailed, Mr. Michael Cruz. At this point, all we want to do is make sure that Douglas County does their job, does a good job, a thorough job, and that justice is brought so that we will not have to continue to go through this. It's not missed us that in this week, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday was earlier this week, and in the middle of this week, we had to deal with this type of racial injustice. So they know who he is. They have gone to the police and filed a report, and they want police to press charges, and I think everyone agrees with that. And I'll say this. A bunch of people have been posting the identity of that guy. I've seen like six names floated. I've seen one name in particular, and it is wrong. It is not that engineer guy people keep talking about. Uh, I do know who it is, and I mean, I'll just really quickly, you know, I know who it is. I'm not gonna put his name out there because the victim already has his name and they put it in the hands of police. And now it's time for the police in Douglasville to do their job. It's like the same reason I didn't put the address out there. I would rather he faces real legal consequences than someone just like trying to go to the house and confront him. So don't do that. Matt, this is the kind of but stuff. Police act a fool, social media. Oh, you'll get busted. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely will. You should. And especially when you see that people are, are videoing. I mean, I was not surprised because we see so many things like this, but how brazen are you when he's telling you welcome to Facebook and he just continues saying the things that he's saying. Uh, I hope that Douglasville actually does their job, and I hope that Georgia has a statute where you can be prosecuted for verbal harassment, because this obviously meets that standard, and this guy needs to be held to account for it. So, Michael, when I was flying, I was flying somewhere. I put it on Instagram. I forgot where I was flying. And I was going through Chicago O'Hare Airport, uh, and I was about to, I to take a seat, and it was like a shoe shine stand. Uh, and this guy was sitting there on FaceTime. And so yeah, I saw I walk up. I said, hey, you know, I'm going to step up. The guy was like, you ain't fucking sitting here. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm sorry. Wh who are you talking to? Uh, and he was like, eh. so he starts cussing me out. And I went, you know what? I said, let me get airport uh, police. So I started looking around. Uh, and so, then, uh, and so then, then, then the guy was like, you know what? Fine, fine. I said, let me explain something to you. I said, I'm going to extend some grace to your ass today. <laughs> I said, because had I pulled my phone out, four million people would see your ass in about 30 seconds. He started apologizing and everything. I said, I don't care what in the hell you're going through. I said, you don't just start cussing the folk out. I said, because if I put you out publicly, I said, your job will be gone and your whole family will know how stupid you are. So he starts apologizing. He, well, he said, well, let me move you. I said, no, 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 I ain't sitting down. I said, but you lucky I got Jesus today. <laughs> These folk, they act a fool. Look, they gonna get busted. They gonna get outed. About 10 sec 20 seconds, go. Yeah, uh, they're gonna get outed. And the uh, I saw your post on Instagram. Now, the, the brazenness that this white guy displayed while the FedEx driver, the African-American FedEx driver was recording, is the same brazenness that Europeans displayed decades ago when they were lynching African Americans yep. and posing for postcard pictures at the same time. Yep. Okay. And what Donald Trump has done is make them feel comfortable yep. with their racism and expression. Hey, so. bomb, hey bomb line is mm -hmm. press charges against his behind. And again, yeah. I do in the airport. I told him, I said, man, you lucky. I said, you lucky I have grace today. I said, because I was about to break 
your ass off publicly. All right, y'all, I gotta go. Landon, come here. So today, y'all, is the last day. My niece, uh, she got her a new job. She's leaving. Praise the Lord. Uh, that way she can stop asking me for money. Uh, so this is, her, this is her last. Shut up. I don't want to hear it. Uh, this is her last day. Uh, this is the one y'all saw in the cars and stuff. So she's got, she gonna work for some construction company, and she also getting married. Uh, but whatever. So uh, again, her last day, and so I'm tired of having to fund her. So thank goodness uh, she finally me. she finally got a job with a raise. So uh, y'all say bye to her. Uh, we gotta go. St. Louis. I'll see y'all this weekend for St. Louis takeover. Book signing tomorrow. I'll see Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock on Sunday. Ho!
The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape. With me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. 